My name is Nick Estes. Um, thank you for inviting me to be here. I uh, also just want to recognize that there are a lot of water protectors in, or that were from Seattle um, uh, uh, and that they are not only just coming to protect our water but also um, to protect um, the water here and the lands here. But also, uh, I think land acknowledgements are really fascinating because they kind of shove off onto um, folks the, the, uh, the ability to not really address what is actually happening. And one day, you know, we should, we should just say, and now it's time to give it back to indigenous people <laughs> and stop just acknowledging. It's like it's acknowledging um, a crime as it's ongoing, but n not doing anything about it. So maybe one day we can move to um, from landing acknowledgements to actual decolonization. Uh, and I think uh, that's one of the things that I try to do in this book is to really push how we're thinking about um, Standing Rock, not just uh, in the context of uh, a movement of indigenous peoples somewhere else that's not here, um, but as a movement, a decolonization movement for North America and thinking about why is it that in 2016, indigenous people or any people in the United States or North America or Turtle Island have to make extraordinary claims to say that they have the right to clean drinking water and why the right to clean drinking water shouldn't be enough. So I'm gonna begin by reading a scene from my book. Um, it's in the middle of the book, um, I'm beginning in the middle. Um, and I think it'll set the stage of, of, of the book and, and then I'll do some more kind of background information. In the aftermath of the October 27, 2016 raid on the 1851 treaty camp, blockading the Dakota Access Pipeline, a rancid smell permeated the camps. Police and private security had heaped at the camp's remnants, ceremonial items such as eagle feathers, pipes, medicine bundles, staffs, along with mangled tents, sleeping bags, clothing, and teepees, into a large pile near the entrance of Ocheti Shakoi camp, which was one of the largest camps of two camps at the, the confluence of the Missouri uh, and Cannonball Rivers. Cops and private security had urinated on the items before returning them. One night after it was ceremonially, or after it was decided to ceremonially burn the urine-soaked remnants, an Ihangtawa elder gathered young water protectors around a fire. She was dressed in the regalia she wore the day of the raid. Hundreds of copper pennies hung by red ribbons from her dark blue trade cloth dress. And she told of her ancestors who were killed during the 1862 US Dakota War. Evicted from their homelands, they fled to present day Standing Rock, crossing the Missouri River not far from the lo location of Ocheti Shakoi camp after U.S. cavalrymen massacred Dakotas and Lakotas in the Whitestone Hill Buffalo Hunt Camp. This was to the day exactly 150 years before Dakota Access private security unleashed attack dogs on unarmed water protectors at a nearby pipeline construction site. The day after Christmas in 1862, soldiers gathered up 38 Dakota men and boys and imprisoned them at Fort Snelling in Makato, or what is now known as Mankato, Minnesota. Their medicine bundles were confiscated, heaped in a large pile and burned as they were led to the gallows singing their death songs. Their crime, defending their nation and homelands. The same week that President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation freeing black slaves, he also signed the death sentences of 38 Dakota patriots. The copper pennies hanging from the elders' regalia had holes drilled into Lincoln's ears with red ribbon threaded through. He didn't, he didn't listen, she said, of the great emancipator, so we opened his ears. After the 1876 Battle of Greasy Grass, Lakota women used awls to carve holes in Custer's ears so he would hear better in the afterlife. Now it was President Barack Obama, North Dakota Governor Jack Dalrymple, and Morton County Sheriff Kyle Kirchmeyer, who refused to listen. As singers began a prayer song, the elder reminded the younger ones that the tears flowing from their eyes were their ancestors speaking through them. 
and that they were not tears of trauma, but of liberation. We survived genocide after genocide, she says. And then she danced and the penny swayed with the flickering fire and billowing smoke. Behind her, armed police were perched on a hill half a mile away, and their bright floodlights glared down on us. Our history is the future. And this is a scene um, at camp um, that I witnessed, I think it was in early November, but there's actually a picture of this, of, of this scene um, on page uh, 88. And it's actually um, Rochelle Bullhead, who was an Ihangtuan elder, who told the story of the penny dress. And as I was growing up, I heard this story. I mean, I've, I've always seen the penny dress, but I actually never knew what it meant. Um, and it was only in this, in, this, in, the, in this context where we were, you know, under what could be called a military occupation with checkpoints um, and security, you know, stops and um, constant aerial surveillance that I learned this history of, of the penny dress that was told, you know, through um, the history of genocide um, from the 1862 U.S. Dakota War to the 1863 to uh, 64 punitive campaigns in which they chased down um, the descendants or the ancestors of Standing Rock, the Dakota people who fled Minnesota, who were exiled from Minnesota in 1862. Um, it was actually a territorial or it was actually a state law that banished um, Dakota people, my ancestors, from our own homelands and then opened scalp bounties on them. Um, actually, Little, Little Crow, who was one of the leaders of the uprising and one of the, the, the headmen at the time, um, was killed um, and his, his, by, a, by a white farmer for picking raspberries in his homelands. And he was scalped, and his scalp um, earned that farmer, I think it was $500. His head, his head was decapitated. It was put on display in the uh, Minnesota Historical Society, and it was only taken down in 1914. But his body um, remained um, at or in possession of the Minnesota Historical Society, I think, until 1972. And they are still recovering um, the bodies of these Dakota patriots who were um, hanged. Um, some of their bodies were dug up by doctors from the Mayo Clinic who used them as cadavers. So for many, in many ways, this is a very recent history. And one of the things that isn't um, often talked about while we understand um, the consequences and the historical meaning behind something such as Wounded Knee, the Wounded Knee Massacre in 1890, oftentimes even the United States government forgets its massacre against Dakota people um, in 1863 before Sand Creek, right? Before the Sand Creek Massacre, which happened in Colorado Territory. Um, and at the Whitestone Hill Massacre, there were 400 Dakota people who were massacred. And there's this story that is told through um, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, who's one of the, the founders of the Sacred Stone Camp and her personal um, history um, and her grandmother, her great grandmother surviving um, that massacre and her being, you know, kind of transposed into um, 2016 fighting another kind of uh, 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 destruction of her homelands. Um, and so why, why this is important, it's in a chapter called War, and why this is important is because throughout this book I'm tracing kind of um, four different invasions. The first one, um, and they're all kind of um, different rounds of accumulation um, and the penetration of capitalism into our territories, right? So the first one is the fur trade. Uh, in the chapter on um, the fur trade, I call it origins. In many ways, it's the origins of, of the capitalist system. And I kind of tell this birth, uh, this uh, origin story of the capitalist system in our territories alongside the origin story of our people, our creation stories, right? Um, and looking at how um, during the fur trade, those were the first man camps, right? Um, and often they're often not framed that way. It's very similar to um, this region as well because they were transient um, workers who were coming into an area that were working in an extractive industry. And where were they working at? Trade forts, right? So it was a very militarized, um, it was a very militarized venture. And I used the example of the Revenant. How many people have seen the Revenant? Yeah, dances with bears. <laughs> um, in that movie, uh, it's, it's actually based on historical, uh, a real historical character, Hugh Glass. Um, that's actually the homelands that I grew up in. It actually takes place in, there's not that many trees, spoiler alert. Um, but 
and while a lot of it's fictionalized and very romanticized, there is one aspect of that film that is very historically accurate, and I think um, the filmmaker captures it very well, is the amount of violence against indigenous people, against the land, and specifically against indigenous women and children. So at the end of that movie, uh, Hugh Glass arrives at Fort Kiowa um, in, uh, on the Missouri River and he encounters women, indigenous women and children being bought and sold out of, outside of this, fur, tr the, this fur, um, fur trade fort. And there's French trappers, there's English trappers, and there's American trappers, right? Um, and it's really fascinating because as much as it was a trade in skin, it was also a, a trade in flesh, right? Um, and that fur trade fort eventually became a settlement, a permanent settlement. Um, it became the town that I grew up in, born and raised in. It, it was called, uh, it's called Chamberlain, South Dakota, which is a border town, right? And so in many ways, um, these man camps became permanent settlements that, you know, white dominated settlements that ring Indian reservations where this kind of dynamic still plays out. So that's, you know, the afterlives of that first round of accumulation, the penetration of capitalism into our territories, right? The second round um, of, of accumulation that I talk about um, targets uh, another one of our non-human kin, the Buffalo Nation, right? With the penetration of the railroad systems, um, the panic of, of 1873, the end of Reconstruction, the withdrawal of federal troops from the South, and they didn't just disappear, right? They went west. And um, I don't really detail it in this particular chapter so much, but it coalesced indigenous and um, freed slaves into you know, a frontier army that eventually became an army that went overseas, right? Um, and so this kind of shored up America's first you know, problem or first obstacle, which was the Indian problem following the Civil War. And I, I document how um, this related to our treaty making, right? So the US, we successfully defeated the United States uh, militarily in two um, wars, two short wars. The first one was um, one that Spotted Tail fought um, for the Powder River country, and the second one was Red Clouds War along the Bozeman Trail uh, in um, 1866 to 68, um, and it forced the United States to sign um, its last treaty with us, which was the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. And one of the ways um, that I, I view that treaty is looking at um, that it wasn't just a treaty between non-human, or between human nations, but it was also a treaty with non-human nations. Article 11 of that treaty says, so long as the buffalo shall range to justify the chase, right? That's the quote. And what that means is um, we were, uh, we had secured a 35 million acre hunting territory, um, so long as the buffalo shall, shall range. And General Miles actually opposed that provision because it nearly doubled the size of our, of our um, treaty territory, up to upwards to 70 million acres, which is about the size of Nevada. And so the treaty commissioners assured General Miles that, well, all we have to do is kill the buffalo. And so then began the targeted annihilation of buffalo, uh, our buffalo nation um, to essentially um, abrogate or to eliminate Article 11 of our, six, our 68 treaty, which essentially annihilated or um, uh, dissolved 35 million acres of our territory. And so there were, there were army deployments that were, weren't actually encountering indigenous people, but were only there to hunt buffalo and to kill buffalo. Um, so that the killing, and even the soldiers themselves talked about to kill, to kill a buffalo is to kill an Indian, right? To take the land. And so the, the, the killing of our non-human kin, right? It's, so we think about settler colonialism as the elimination of the native to take the land, right? But it's also the elim elimination of our relationship with that land and the non-human non um, elements that live there, right? And so that's the second round, the second round of accumulation, the second invasion, right? The third invasion is during um, the so-called New Deal era when to save the settler economy, once again, the United States turned to so-called surplus indigenous land and proposed um, past legislation known as the 1944 Flood Control Act, um, which then became known as the Pick Sloan Plan, which proposed or authorized the Army Corps of Engineers, another branch of the military, by the way, to build five um, earthen rolled dams on the main stem of, of the Missouri River, 
All of those dams were strategically located on Indian reservations and primarily Lakota and Dakota reservations. And so as a result um, of these dams, um, they were, you know, provide, they were, the, the goal was to provide labor and relief, right, is the language that they used. Labor for returning veterans from World War II, um, such as my grandfather, who was a Lakota code talker, um, but he was, you know, fighting for the military that was gonna take his land when he returned home. Um, and I detail a little bit of, of my own personal history with that. So in 1944, this was passed. And, and this kind of um, happened simultaneous with, simultaneously with two pieces of, of key legislation um, known as relocation and termination. And termination was essentially the, the US, um, a US policy to get out of the Indian business, to liquidate um, or to end federal recognition and to liquidate um, tribal uh, nations and their resources and relocation was to essentially get indigenous people off the land, right? And so these, these dams actually provided a physical means to do such, right? It flooded um, four agency towns in Crow Creek, Cheyenne River, Lower Brule, and Standing Rock. And so these agency towns were essentially reservation capitals, right? Um, and it also relocated 30% of our populations, destroyed 90% of our timber, um, and destroyed 75% of our wildlife, which included plant life as well, taking about half a million acres or half the size of the state of Rhode Island. And so these Army Corps of Engineer planners working in tandem with the Bureau of in uh, Indian Affairs um, calculated and assessed our resources uh, our caloric intake of the so-called free goods of nature, and then planned what you know Marx um, called the proletarianization of our people, right, to force us into the wage economy. Um, and it was largely resisted um, by my, you know, by my grandfather. My great grandfather um, fought the first um, uh, attempts to dam our river in 1937. My grandfather, who I said was a World War II veteran fought the damming of a river um, in, in 57, when it was flooded the first time, our land was flooded the first time in 1957 by the Fort Randall Dam and the second time in 1963 um, with the Big Bend Dam. And so the reason, this was the, the third invasion, right? And I'll get back to why this is important and how it kind of leads up into um, the, 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 the present um, what, what I would call the fourth invasion, which is the North American oil boom. So in 2007, 2008, the United States economy collapsed, right? Something we now know as the, the, the mortgage crisis, the housing crisis. Um, what's often not talked about around this time is also the North American oil boom began. Changes in fracking technology allowed uh, Canadian, primarily Canadian oil companies to begin developing technology to get Inaccess previously inaccessible oil and gas reserves, right, by hydraulically fracturing um, the Earth's crust, essentially, right? And so at the same time you have the housing market collapse, you also have a, an oil boom. And from 2008 to 2016, domestic oil production in the United States increased by 80%. Um, it's often something that um, we're in this kind of like moment right now where, you know, with the, the recent tapping into the Permian Basin, in Southwest Texas, um, Southeast New Mexico has launched the United States as the number one oil producer uh, in the world, um, surpassing Russia and surpassing Saudi Arabia, right? And this began, uh, it began much be, uh, um, a long, you know, <laughs> before this, but at the same time, it really kind of intensified in this, in this area. So you also see uh, in 2007, a drop in the price of oil with the housing crisis, right? And this is, also kind of our present crisis in, in Venezuela, right? Because you also see the drop of oil in 2014 as well. Um, and in many ways, and I don't really get into it in this book, but in many ways, the attempted military coup, uh, the recent one, um, but then also just the, the long kind of uh, attempts to choke out the Venezuelan economy to facilitate an overthrow of the democratically elected um, president, um, uh, Nicolas Maduro, is very much embedded in the construction and the creation of carbon infrastructure in the United States, right? So as the United States is essentially drilling itself out of the Great Recession in 2008, uh, in this period, it's also intensifying um, and uh, bolstering sort of uh, aggression towards um, the Venezuelan government. 
And so in many ways, the oil, um, the, the connections on the ground at Standing Rock, uh, many people were saying that this is an extension of US imperialism in Venezuela in a domestic sense, right, on indigenous land, right? So I want to frame this as very much a global kind of project. It's not just something that's isolated in one part of the world, right? Um, you also have the tapping into um, the oil sands in Alberta, Canada, which has created a dead zone um, with an area the size of the state of Florida, right? The surface area of the state, of, uh, the size of, of the state of Florida. And so if we talk about the Dakota Access Pipeline as originating out of the Bakken region where there was an oil boom, and they call it the Black Snake, if we look at current pipeline maps uh, and uh, carbon infrastructure maps in, the, in, in North America, then the tar sands are the snake pit, essentially, right? Where all of these pipelines and proposed pipelines are spiraling out of. And so this is the context. This is a new round of dispossession that we're facing. And in many ways, the analysis that I gave just extends beyond the scope of this book because you know, I wrote it at a specific time, so in that way it's dated, but nonetheless we can see the afterlives of Standing Rock that continued, you know, the last leg of the Dakota Access Pipeline infrastructure uh, is still being built and finalized, uh, you know, with the Bayou Bridge Pipeline, right? And we can talk about Line 3, and we can talk about the recent evictions of Unistoten Camp and, and so-called uh, British Columbia as extensions of this war, right, of this... Um, I think Max Boot even called it <laughs> um, the, the, the extending of the, the U.S. security state and, and securing sort of uh, oil reserves in Venezuela, in Venezuela and why it was in the strategic interest of the United States to essentially choke off that economy, right, to launch itself as the number one oil producer. So um, I want to talk about, you know, one of the things... Um, and this, is, this also isn't in the book, but one of the things that, that got me interested in sort of petro-capitalism, and I would, you know, a new term what I would call petro-imperialism is, uh, in 2007, I was living with my dad on the reservation in Lower Brule, and the uh, Lower Brule propane tank uh, truck came by and filled up our, um, our um, heating uh, tank in the middle of winter and I was like I ran out I was like no because it's always really expensive I was like don't fill it up I don't want to pay this and the guy's like no no no, it's cool it's taken care of we'll give you like it's 100 free uh, 100 gallons of uh, free heating oil and I was like what the heck and they gave me this little piece of paper I looked into it and there was this company called Sitco and I was like what the heck is this and then I found out later that um, our tribal nations had negotiated um, uh, heating assistance from the Bolivarian government back under Hugo Chavez back in 2007 and from 2007 to 2011 uh, the CITGO which is a Venezuelan um, owned American oil company in the United States um, donated as relief um, to uh, not just um, Indian reservations in the Northern Plains but also black communities um, and just low income communities throughout the United States um, and it was our it was our people um, who negotiated that um, assistance as a form of solidarity and as a form of internationalism. And I just want to read um, a, chap or a, a section from my chapter on internationalism and why this makes sense in the context of our own um, struggles as not just indigenous peoples, but specifically as the Ocheti, Shakoni, the Lakota, and Dakota people. And this is a quote. As we came with this pipe, also, we come with the treaty, the 1868 treaty. That treaty is bloody. It was made over 100 years ago. It was our elders who told us that this was a good treaty. But somebody spilled blood on this treaty. And they said, you are going before the world with your pipe, and you will offer it to the world, the world community. And if they accept, then together, we can help clean this treaty. This is a quote from Larry Redshirt in Geneva in 1977. In the late summer of 1977, a small group of indigenous elders from Canada's six nations, the Ocheti Shakoi, Hopi, Panama, Guatemala, Amazon, Mexico, and Chile, led a delegation of 120 through, through Geneva, Switzerland. The, mark, the march bore the marks of history, having survived centuries of genocide and punitive colonial policies of assimilation and land theft, 
They also carried with them the aspiration of hundreds of millions of indigenous peoples from around the globe to gain a seat at the United Nations. Geneva and the UN had never seen anything like it before and probably have not since. Dressed in their traditional regalia, the delegation sang the Ray Raymond Yellow Thunder song, widely known as the American Indian Movement song. To honor the Oglala elder brutally murdered by white vigilantes in 1972, the procession wound through the quaint mountain town, arriving at the Palais des Nations. UN security guards opened the tall double doors as they approached and the singing grew louder as they ascended the stairwell to the second floor council chambers, where world leaders had met to decide the fates of colonized peoples and where generations of American Indians had been categorically denied entry as nations. 54 years earlier, at this exact location, Cayuga leader Descaje, or Levi General from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, made an unsuccessful appeal to the League of Nations in defense of indigenous rights and nationhood in protest of the overthrow of the Six Nations government by the Canadian state. This time, however, with the support of Soviet bloc countries, third world nations, and the non-aligned movement, a national liberation mov and na national liberation movements such as the South African anti-apartheid struggle and the Palestine Liberation Organization, indigenous peoples had to a large degree provincialized the influence of the North Atlantic powers to dictate their diplomatic relations outside the settler colony. Consequently, US media and diplomats largely boycotted the, uh, the conference that laid the groundwork for what became the touchstone document of international indigenous rights, the 2007 Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, a document for Anglo settler states, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia initially refused to endorse. While indigenous representation has become a permanent feature at the UN, its radical origins are less well known. The historic 1977 Geneva gathering was preceded by a simpler but no less monumental gathering in Standing Rock along the banks of the Missouri River. In the heat of the Northern Plains summer, 5,000 people from more than 97 different indigenous nations met from June 8th to the 16th in 1974. By the end of the week, the International Indian Treaty Council was founded as an international arm of the American Indian Movement, or AIM, tasked with gaining international recognition at the UN for Indigenous Peoples of the Western Hemisphere. The Treaty Council's founding document, the Declaration of Continuing Independence, foregrounded nationhood and treaty rights as central features of an American Indian political identity. Quote, we condemn the United States of America for its gross violation of the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty in militarily surrounding, killing, and starving the citizens of the independent Oglala Nation into exile, it read, in reference to the brutal crack crackdown on AIM following their, their, um, following their occupation of Wounded Knee in 1973. The Treaty Council appealed to the conscionable nations to join, quote, in charging and prosecuting the United States of America for its genocidal practices against the sovereign native nations, most illustrated recently by uh, Wounded Knee 1973, and the continued refusal to sign the United Nations 1948 Treaty on Genocide, end quote. Following the 71-day siege, AIM leadership had been arrested and tied up in uh, court proceedings, and then came the brutal repression under the infamous FBI counterintelligence program, also known as COINTELPRO, that nearly destroyed indigenous, black, and revolutionary movements in the United States. The strategic turn into international human rights law largely saved the indigenous movement from utter, utter collapse in a moment of intense state repression. So in this chapter, um, I don't, necessarily begin, I mean, I begin in 1974, but instead of going forward with the International um, Treaty Council history, I actually go backwards to 19, the 1910s with the formation of the Society of American Indians, which came out of the Treaty Councils of the late 19th century, um, where um, after like following Wounded Knee specifically, um, all of our spiritual practices and our cultural practices largely went underground, but also our political organization went underground as well. 
And so these treaty councils essentially kept alive the knowledge of the treaty. Uh, my, gra my great grandfather was Yeska. He was a translator for um, the treaty councils. And so he actually traveled with one of my um, relatives, uh, Louis Grassrope. He traveled with his um, great, great grandfather as well. And so there's this long tradition, not just within uh, my family, but within all of you know, these indigenous families of knowing these things, of growing up with the treaty and understanding what it meant, right? And so the Treaty Council wasn't having any success for many reasons. First of all, we weren't citizens of the United States, so we couldn't bring a court case against the United States. We had no Fifth Amendment rights, right? So the Treaty Councils decided to use young, educated um, boarding school uh, students to create a national organization. It was the first national uh, organization in the United S uh, States um, that was solely uh, for indigenous people called the Society of American Indians. And I would make the argument that that SAI, as it was known, um, was very much an extension of the Treaty Council. It wasn't, there was a lot of, you know, varying uh, kind of like uh, approaches to it. And it was, it was considered a progressive movement that advocated citizenship and some people went as far um, as to advocate assimilation. But nonetheless, it had membership, uh, entirely indigenous membership, except for one member who was W.E.B. Du Bois, who was the only non-indigenous um, voting member of the organization. And so in many ways, he influenced the direction uh, and it was inspired by NCAI, or uh, NC, uh, NCAA, or sorry, <laughs> the NAACP, <laughs> so many acronyms, NC, uh, the N NAACP, but also Charles Eastman, who was a medical doctor at Wounded Knee, but also a Dakota um, physician, um, who's boarding school educated, who, um, you know, he was friends with um, um, W.E. Du Bois and very much influenced by Du Bois's um, work and advocacy, so much so that Charles Eastman's first book was called The Soul of an Indian, um, which was very um, deriving its title from The Soul of Black Folk. And W.E.B. Du Bois and um, Charles Eastman actually traveled internationally attending the Universal Racial Conference our Congress in 1912, um, the same year that um, SAI was founded, ironically um, or strategically, on Columbus Day in October, October 12th. Um, so SAI began as kind of this um, progressive um, advocacy um, campaign. Um, it really was um, radicalized by the Secretary Zinkala Shah, who was a Yankton um, Sioux uh, poet, but also uh, uh, boarding school educated. Um, and while Eastman has often kind of um, gained a lot of notoriety, that, um, Zink Kalashah, because she's an indigenous woman, didn't gain so much notoriety, but Zink Kalashah actually pushed the organization to seek recognition at the League of Nations um, following World War I, because at that time, uh, there were about 8,000 um, um, American Indians who were not citizens who served um, in the U.S. Army. It was the highest enlistment rate of any nation uh, or of any demographic in the, in the United States. And so in many ways, if you look at the real photographs of World War I, Britain was bringing in its colonized um, folks from Africa um, to fight its war, right? So it was very much, they say it's a European civil war, but in many ways it was fought by colonized people. And it was very much um, true of the US Army, which um, you know, um, African Americans were overrepresented and so too were indigenous people who, who, in many ways, SAI was making the argument that they were fighting not just for citizenship, but for a right to get a treaty hearing in Congress. And that's the argument that they made. Um, and if they didn't get a treaty hearing in Congress, then they would take the claim to the League of Nations. And of course, that didn't really work out, but nonetheless, that really laid the groundwork for the international work to come. Right? And that's the argument that I make in the sense that it, I'm looking specifically at the Ocheti Shakoin internationalist tradition that goes back to the early 1900s and looking at how from um, the, the International Indian Treaty Council was really building on that work, right? And the International Indian Treaty Council um, was founded to address two claims. The first one was the Black Hills claim. Um, and the second one was to address the dams. And that one has kind of always fallen by the, way, the wayside, but these treaty councils that existed at that time, the ones that asked 
the American Indian movement to come and take a stand at Wounded Knee. We're also asking the American Indian movement and Red Power activists and organizations to take their claims to the world court. And so over the course of four decades, they've worked with um, initially um, with um, sort of leftist governments, with uh, national liberation organizations that I detail. Um, actually, a lot of the human rights frameworks that are, that are around indigenous people came out of um, the anti-apartheid struggle that recognized Zionism as a form of racism, but also indigenous peoples as an international category, right? Uh, and began defining peoplehood along those lines. Um, and of course, you know, um, Zionism was, you know, um, that, that uh, sort of provision was removed under the 1993 Oslo Accords um, and the sort of radical origins of the internationalist movement for indigenous peoples was also obscured at that moment. So um, I was just trying to, in that chapter, show the origins of why something like Standing Rock, which brought in so many different people from different nations and different social locations, very much in, in many ways was a continuation of what I call the long tradition of indigenous resistance um, that uses um, internationalism, that uses a form of relationality that doesn't, isn't just a cultural um, or like a local thing, right? But actually indigenous peoples have always imagined themselves um, as people of the world, right? Um, so that's, that's what that chapter focuses on. And I wanna wrap up with a final reading and just kind of a reflection. And this is um, from the concluding chapter called Liberation. Ancestors of indigenous resistance didn't merely fight against settler colonialism. They fought for indigenous life and just relations with human and non-human relatives and with the earth. When Custer and his men descended on the sun dance at Greasy Grass, the ancestors were dancing as they have since time immemorial to make the tree of life and Black Elk's vision bloom and to ensure the rebirth of their people and the earth. In 2016, as construction of the Black Snake, the Dakota Access Pipeline began, they danced again, this time on the shores of the, at the Ocheti Shakoi camp in Sacred Stone to protect Minisose, the Missouri River, and Unchi Maka, Grandmother Earth. Indigenous resistance is not a one-time event. It continually asks what pro proliferates in the absence of empire. Thus it defines freedom not as the absence of settler colonialism, but as the amplified presence of indigenous life and just relations with human and non-human relatives and with the earth. To invoke Ganawagi Mohawk scholar Audra Simpson, the refusal to accept the impossible condition of banishment and disappearance from one's homelands and outright dispossession, structures indigenous political practice of return, restoration, and reclamation of belonging and place. And ancestors also danced during the initial planning of the Pixlone Dam on the Missouri River before their Sundance grounds were flooded. Indian reservations and indigenous life were entirely absent from the original Army Corps maps and plans. When the Army Corps flooded our homelands, the agency headquarters twice, our nation, the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe, was forced to imagine how to reconstruct itself after flooding and relocation, and how to do so in a way that re would reflect our values. We drew and redrew the layout of our community. New roads and water pipelines had to be planned and constructed. Entire cemeteries, our dead ancestors had to be disinterred and relocated along with our living ancestors to higher ground. Planners ultimately chose a half moon shaped community structure, a symbolic gesture to traditional camp arrangements with an open community center surrounded by teepee lodges whose entrance opened east to the rising sun. In the center of this newly planned lower Brule community was a school emphasizing the importance placed on education and fanning out from there were municipal and administration buildings such as churches, a juvenile detention center, and several rows of housing. And while imprisonment and Christianity were foreign institutions to traditional Cheti Shakomi societies, the modern relocated community made an imagined space for youth incarceration in churches. And like the Army Corps and working alongside them, the planners of the Dakota Access Pipeline imagined building a pipeline in a world where native people did not exist. And they had to imagine us out of existence to justify trespassing on indigenous territory and protected treaty lands. And when the pipeline risked interfering with the white residential areas of Bismarck, North Dakota, 
it was rerouted such that the danger of water contamination was outsourced to the downriver native nation of Standing Rock. And when Dakota Access sought protection of its private property and investments, the rights of way across the land, police and private security stepped in on their behalf, imagining indigenous peoples as the threat. These were modern day settlers surrounded by an indigenous led uprising. And Dakota Access's trespass through unceded treaty territory in the militarized crackdown on water protectors was made to look like self-defense. Settlers in the fort surrounded by hostile natives. Police and military and private security set up their own bases and planned their own theater of operations to wage low-level warfare against their prayer camps. In emails published by the Muckrock Watchdog website, Tony, Toby Schweitzer, a helicopter contractor from Back and Western, a quick response oil spill and environmental cleanup company operating out of Mandan, North Dakota, sent an email on September 14th, 2016 with the subject line, quote, Israeli crowd control method to North Dakota probation officers working the no dapple protests. Quote, YouTube crowd control, have a nice day, Schweitzer wrote to the police officers. In the email sent prior to major police attacks and raids that would later make national headline news, he suggested the cops policing pipeline protest invests in skunk spray, an Israeli chemical weapon invented to degrade and humiliate Palestinians by dousing them in a nauseating putrid biomedical odor that takes days to remove. Forget the wall, he wrote. Just put sprayers all along the southern border with sensors. Might have saved a lot of storefronts in Baltimore and Ferguson. The US needs to get some of this for the looters in any out of control demonstration. Israelis crowd control method. Now we are talking, brilliant skunk spray. Such comments add insult to injury for Palestinians defending their homes against demolition or protesting the killing of loved ones. And in other emails, officers shared a Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, Field of Force Operations Manual, which guided police officers in correct crowd control methods, pain compliance techniques, and the application of riot control agents, including chemical weapons and projectiles, such as rubber bullets and beanbag rounds. These Non-lethal weapons were deployed against unarmed pro protesters with ritualistic brutality, taking two individuals' eyesight and one woman's arm, while wounding and traumatizing countless others. And the connections were clear. Local law enforcement and private security imagined themselves participating in a global counterinsurgency against civilian populations that extended from Palestine to Baltimore, Ferguson, the US-Mexico borders, and now Standing Rock. The war was against black life, Palestinian life, migrant life, and native life. And the tactics employed by Tiger Swan, the mur murky mercenary security contractor hired by Dakota Access, were also confirmation that this was a global war. The security company had cut its teeth in the United States never ending war on terror, in which it was deployed to run counterinsurgency operations against civilians in Iraq and Afghanistan. Tiger Swan now applied the same techniques to water protectors. And The Intercept reports that security personnel frequently refer to water protectors as terrorists, planned prayer actions as attacks, and the camps as a battlefield. They also track the presence of water protectors of Middle Eastern descent, noting specifically the presence of Palestinians in the camps. Tiger Swan went so far as to describe indigenous uprising as a jihadist insurgency. And when Tiger Swan briefed local law enforcement on camp activities, they frequently referenced aerial photography which they used to monitor the growth and movement of the camps. In one situation report, an image of a gorilla is superimposed atop the camp. This was Harambe, the gorilla killed at the Cincinnati Zoo when a black child fell into his cage. On one hand, white supremacists have used the killing of Harambe to mock black people online, charging that the gorilla had to be killed because the black parents were careless. On the other hand, the comparison of black people to monkeys and gorillas is a well-established racist trope. And now Tiger Swan is evoking this anti-black history to racialize, mock, and degrade water protectors with tropes of primitivism. And to Dakota Access and local law enforcement, the camps were a place of death, a place to be destroyed, a place that threatened to expose the illegitimacy of settlement. In the orientation pamphlet for new camp arrivals at, no, at the Nodapple camp was a hand-drawn map of the site 
and it's featured in the, the um, verso page on the final chapter, the beginning. Roads had been named for indigenous revolutionary heroes such as Red Cloud and the Red Warrior Society. Indigenous nations had also set up their own camps on site and their locations were also shown. The map indicated where to find security who were tasked in part with keeping out drugs and alcohol. It also showed where to get food, medical care, and camp supplies. This reflected the values the new community of the new community, that indigenous peoples not merely survive, but thrive. And no doubt will offer a brief vision of what a future premised on indigenous justice would look like. And for all its faults, there is something to be learned from the treaty camps at the confluence of the Missouri and Cannibal Rivers. Free food, free education, free health care, legal aid, and a strong sense of community, safety, and security were guaranteed to all. Most reservations in the United States don't have access to these services nor do most poor people. Yet in the absence of empire, people came together to help each other, to care for one another. And the no dapple camps were designed according to need, not profit. There were no prisons or armed uh, bodies of the state. And that's what separated them from the world of cops, settlers, and oil companies that surrounded them. Capitalism is not merely an economic system, but a social system. And it was here abundantly evident that indigenous social systems offered a radically different way of relating to other people in the world. In drawing from the black radical tradition, Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls the creation of this kind of world a form of abolition geography that, quote, starts from the homely premise that freedom is a place. Indeed, indigenous freedom was and is a place, and for a moment it took shape in, in the form of the no dapple camps, which didn't just imagine a future without settler colonialism and the oppressive institution of the state, but created that future in the here and now. They were a resurgent geography that reconnected indigenous peoples with the land. And unlike the cynical and exclusive world of the settler who had removed, confined, erased, and dispossessed indigenous peoples from place, this place capaciously welcomed the excluded, while also centering the core of an indigenous life world, relationality. At its center was the resurgence and reunification of the Ocheti Shakoni. And much like the first Palestinian intifada, anti-colonial resistance began by delinking the community from the settler state. And from 1987 to 1993, Palestinians built alternative economies, popular education models, healthcare services, and women's committees. Palestinian women also used the revolution underway to challenge heteropatriarchy, which was as anathema to Palestinian liberation from Israeli um, occupation. And during the Nodapo camps, women LGBTQ and two-spirit activists challenged settler colonialism and did so according to their own customs, calling on cis indigenous men to recognize that heteropatriarchy was not just as untenable as the US occupation, um, or was just as untenable as the US occupation or as the destruction of land and water. And beyond the Dakota Access Pipeline, a growing international movement is fighting the expanding network of pipelines across North America, the Kinder Morgan, Keystone XL, Enbridge Line 9, Bayou Bridge, TransCanada Energy East, among a whole host of others, connect indigenous nations and front lines communities. The appearance of each new flashpoint of struggle indicates a growing anti-colonial resistance led by indigenous peoples against settler colonialism and extractive capitalism. And new pipelines are creeping across the continent like a spider web with frightening speed, but in the process, they are also connecting and inciting to action disparate communities of the exploited and dispossessed. And each pipeline exists in relation to other pipelines, and while DAPL technically only extends from North Dakota to Illinois, it is fundamentally a transnational project, interleaking with other pipelines and oil infrastructure to ship oil to a global market, crossing the boundaries of, a set of settler states and trespassing through indigenous um, territories. A vast array of solidarity networks supported the Nodapal struggle. Black Lives Matter, Palestinian justice organization, religious groups and military veterans, and many more from other social locations and, mo and movements galvanized support for the indigenous-led resistance, far, from, far beyond the physical geography of Standing Rock. And No Dapple was reminiscent of other allied struggles that have enriched the indigenous struggle in the past, including the International Indian Treaty Council in the 20th century, encountering settlers' colonialism's own physical infrastructure, trade routes, 
railroads, dams, and now oil pipelines is the infrastructure of indigenous resistance, its ideas and practices of solidarity. And the resistance camps may have been temporary, but the struggle for native liberation continues and the fort is falling. And given that the western frontier of US expansion closed in 1890, the 19th century Indian wars fought and won, Indian citizenship was imposed in 1924, a formal apology was issued in 2010, the, the tribal self-determination era was inaugurated by Nixon in 1970, past wrongs were settled on the recent um, Cobell lawsuit, and nation-to-nation -nation rhetoric and policies increased under Obama, along with the placement of key indigenous uh, leaders within his administration. Why was there need to create another movement? One way of answering this question is to look at the movement marching under the banner of Black Lives Matter. Why did it arise under the Obama administration? Anti-police or anti-black police violence didn't profoundly increase under Obama's presidency, but it did not dramatically decrease either. Nevertheless, Obama's presidency brought into sharp focus the limits of racial inclusion under the rule of liberalism and capitalism. Consider the 2015 police murder of Freddie Gray in Baltimore. Freddie Gray was killed by black police officers, and neither a black district attorney, a black mayor, nor a black president could save his life. No matter who's in charge, as Kiongi Yamada Taylor points out, the current political system cannot save black lives. The same could be said of indigenous peoples and the warming planet. Obama's 2010 new energy security plan, greatly enhanced under Trump in 2017, incentivized and dramatically increased domestic oil and gas production, opening up previously protected federal lands managed by the Department of Interior. And under capitalism, neither Democrat nor Republican can save indigenous lands or black lives. The continuance of state-sanctioned racial terror against black and native people, from police violence to energy development, from one administration to the next, demonstrates only radical change in the form of decolonization the repatriation of stolen lands and stolen lives can undo centuries of settler colonialism. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? solidarity with the water protectors. Um, and what, what struck me is that settlers in North Dakota were not, my, my perception is anyway, that settlers in North Dakota were not themselves even left, even kind of, um, yeah, that, 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 that source of support or solidarity wasn't as, as present. It felt like a lot of people coming in from out of state, at least mm -hmm. it was my, my perception. So I'm curious about that. Right, so, so in a way, the kind of internationalism of solidarity is part of the answer, I think, right? That it's not just local. But I guess I'm curious about that, you know, strategically in terms of the, the movement, or, yeah, is, is there potential for those sort of like local settler indigenous encounters and for solidi solidarity there that maybe, you know, Standing Rock tells us something about the limitations of? Yeah. You know, North Dakota is an interesting place uh, politically and geographically. Um, it's much different than South Dakota, even though they're kind of lumped in together. And I, the reason why I say that is because this was pointed out at the beginning of, um, like when the camp started really kind of growing, was that there was like, well, where was this Cowboy Indian Alliance that formed in South Dakota and Nebraska? Well, that work hadn't really been done in um, North Dakota, primarily because the oil and gas industry employed, you know, employed so many people. But there were, there were um, folks from North Dakota. Actually, um, there was a, <laughs> um, I, I, I'll, I'll say this nicely. <laughs> there was a guy who was there, his dad was actually a cop um, who was working, um, f he was a state, uh, uh, North Dakota State Highway Patrolman. And he was, we went to this, we went to this action in Bismarck and 
you know, I didn't know he had like dreads and I was like really skeptical. <laughs> I was like, oh no, not a white guy with dreads. Don't get in the car with us. But he did. <laughs> and in those moments, you just kind of have to like, this is what it is, you know, um, and this is what it's about. And it's, um, and he was, he was arrested and he was beat up by the police, you know, but when the local media would interview people, they would only interview the ranchers, the police officers, right? Uh, a friend of mine, as I document in the book, uh, from South Dakota, a lot of uh, my friends from South Dakota, not, um, you know, who were non-native came, and they were very moved, because this happened at a time when the, um, you know, it was around, it was the elections were happening, right? And so, in many ways, there was no alternative, right? After Trump was elected, people were so disillusioned in so many ways, it, it attracted a lot of these folks who were completely devastated by the, the election. Um, and it was the only resistance movement that was going on at the time, right? Um, so the camps ex like exploded in, in November because of this reason, um, after November 8th um, specifically. I was actually there in, in the camp the day that you know Trump was elected. And it almost kind of didn't matter in some ways. It was just like, well, this is all happening under Obama, so like, how is it gonna get any worse, or how can it get worse under Trump? But I think um, to kind of go back to that question, um, there is, you know, in, in the, I was born and raised in a border town and I grew up in a trailer park, you know, and like uh, there's a lot of poor white people in, in South Dakota and they call it white flight um, because there's just no economic alternative, right? And so in many ways, white supremacy kills white people too. And in many ways, we think of white supremacy and settler colonialism as controlling the behaviors of native people and um, people of color and black people, et cetera. But, its first and primary target is white people to control their behavior, right? And to just to provide an ideological justification for the reason why these things exist this way. And so some of the work that's happening now um, is moving towards, there's like the first socialist uh, milieu. It's not necessarily coalesced into a party yet or anything like that or an organization in South Dakota, which is very exciting. Um, it's headed up by native folks who are very interested in left politics, um, but it's also brought together a lot of white folks as well from like working class backgrounds. And I think um, in the past, if we look at the Cowboy Indian Alliance and um, the, the work that was used to, the alliance that was used to evict uranium mining from the Black Hills region actually used unions, in a strategic alliance with unions that actually adopted the Fort Laramie Treaty within their um, their union constitutions as like a founding document. And these were gold miners who were mining in our sacred lands, who understood that sovereignty, indigenous sovereignty and treaty rights protected them as workers. And so there are utilities in that in that sense. In many ways, a lot of these um, landowners who were living on um, out, you know, in the path of the Keystone XL pipeline are realizing that the treaties are their last resort, right? And that um, private property doesn't have the sanctity that it, you know, once had. And they start off as these kind of like libertarians with this, you know, idea of private property as, you know, the highest form of whatever. Um, <laughs> theft. Yeah. The property was a treaty. I don't think it's so. Contract between. But it's, it's not between a nation and a nation. So it's, it's, it's an individual and it's a promise and it's, it's part of settler citizenship, I would say, in very, in, in many ways. But, I think that class dynamic um, really has to be looked at. And I think when people organize, they often think of our territories as flyover country. But if you look at a map and the people who voted against Trump, I like to say voted against and not voted for Hillary. <laughs> but if you, if you look at a map in the last elections, you have these large swaths of territory in the middle of America and a flyover country in quote unquote red states, not the good kind of red. Um, and these red states that are blue, Right? And if you look at um, Standing Rock, Sioux County in North Dakota, it voted like almost 98% for Obama, 98 for in 2008 and 2016, and almost this, um, you know, the same way uh, with, uh, for Hillary in, in the recent election. So these are progressive, left-leaning populations that control, or nations, I should say, that control large swaths of territory that we should be looking into, not just as people who live in other parts of the region, but as organizers, right? And I think that's an untapped potential um, that we really need to focus on. And the police actually used in a graphic, it's not in here, but I, have, I usually show a presentation. They have this graph of 
um, all the out-of-state protesters who were arrested, and they used it to like criminalize um, the water protectors. And I remember I was sitting in camp, and one of my friends was like, "Hey, man, do you see this? Like, look at all this solidarity we got." <laughs> There's nobody from Wyoming and like Alabama, of course, but <laughs> but it also reminds me of like places like the Freedom Ride movement and everything. It took um, uh, you know folks from outside of that region to really change things, and I think it's it's going to take that as well. So, kind of building off something you were talking about earlier, uh, one question that I kind of have, kind of getting your opinion on, is you see. Other indigenous tribes like the Puyallup calling to action on the LNG, and you see First Nation tribes calling to action on the Trans, like the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And I've been kind of wondering why those particular calls to action haven't been answered as cumulatively as Standing Rock was. I know you mentioned that you know it was during an election, it was right in the height of it, so people were kind of more politically active at that moment, but. Do you see any other reasons potentially kind of in the political milieu, the cultural milieu, why some other calls to action over a very similar issue aren't as answered as widely? Well, I think um, with Dakota, the, the Dakota Access Pipeline, it's, it was the movement that ar arose out of that was really kind of the remnants of the Keystone XL Pipeline movement that defeated the, key, uh, the northern leg of the Keystone XL back in 2015, which now has been reauthorized. But that movement didn't just dissipate, right? There were um, culture camps and resistance camps that had been set up prior to that, and people were organizing. Um, so the infrastructure was already there. And um, I remember when, like, hearing about Dakota Access, but there wasn't a lot of movement on it either. And so it was like, on, it was not really on anyone's radar at that time because the big one was Keystone XL. And so in, in many ways, I would say that the reason why there was um, the kind of response is because there had been th this groundwork that had already been laid out. Um, and it's not to say that these other pipelines aren't as important, but I think there was, you know, this wasn't just like a moment. It wasn't just like call, call to action. Everyone's like, oh yeah, you know, we're gonna go out. It takes like on the ground organizing grassroots work. Like it takes a lot of work. And a lot of these people who were involved who often weren't, you know, in front of um, cameras or microphones that were talking, were doing this since 2011, and doing that on the ground work, you know, um, whether it was petitioning or lobbying or just doing the work in their communities to get their tribes to um, be opposed to this. Or, you know, in our case, we had to actually stand against our own tribe, which I document in in the book, who had made a deal with Trans Canada, and so all of this was happening years and years and years before. Um, the, the Standing Rock movement happened. So it wasn't just out of the blue and it wasn't just a selective solidarity. It was, there was an infrastructure in place. Yeah, within, um, <coughs> I haven't seen the book yet, so I don't know if it's in there or not, but in terms of that idea of solidarity and you mentioned an international movement, um, there's a lot of uh, stuff in the news right now about indigenous people in several countries that are under assault, Colombia, India is clearing forests, um, and it's almost uh, you know, on a, an increased scale um, compared to what it might have been doing historically just because we can mechanize things. Um, how involved is sort of like an organizational structure between uh, Native peoples here um, that are involved and connected to some of those movements, sort of a worldwide uh, movement? Well, out of the UN kind of work, um, there, was, there was created the UN uh, Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, where a lot of the things that you're talking about are being brought up. But just because you don't hear about them doesn't mean that they're, they're not happening. And I think it's more a symptom of the United States and US exceptionalism than it has to do with anything that the connections aren't being made, because they are. People do know about those. Like, we talk about it all the time. Modi is going to you know, forcefully displace like almost more than nine million people to build, you know, palm oil trees for this biofuel craze that's happening, right? Um, we, we're very conscious of that. Or the fact that, you know, the FARC um, and the demobilization of the FARC and the removal of kind of this paramilitary force to protect Afro-Colombians and indigenous peoples in Colombia is opening them up to mining and logging. We know about this. Because the U.S. media doesn't report on it doesn't mean that it's not happening. And I think it's important to remember that um, as first, first worlders 
you know, quote unquote, is that we have access to all of this social capital and all the media, but we are the most uninformed people on the planet when it comes to these issues. Yeah. Or sorry, I would, um, go this way. Is there legal action um, taking place? Because I've, I've read a lot of, since uh, two people were blind, one person mm -hmm. lost an arm, I'm wondering if there's something in the courts right now to help uh, give justice to the people that were fighting the apple? Yes. And um, has there been wins? Or what, what has it been like? I don't know the specifics of those cases. Um, a lot of them are civil cases. They're not criminal. and. I think that most of the energy has been uh, on the people who are, the water protectors who are incarcerated, like Red Fawn Fallis, Little Feather, uh, Marcus uh, Rattler, and then um, Dion Ortiz was actually recently released. But um, there's, you know, they're serving years in prison, federal prison for this. And I think that's important that, to remember that there are political prisoners that are out there. And one of the first things I did when my book was published was send them copies of it. So um, I hope they read it. I hope they like it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's too bad we can't do something. I can help them be free or for the there's free get the, the like if there's something. There's a website called um, the Water Protectors Legal Collective that you should check out. I, um, my question kind of follows up on the first one. Um, I, it's my experience that a lot of the like, leftists organizing doesn't actually uh, deal with settler colonialism, and is you know like doing a Marxist analysis to just come you know like have this new oppressive state really with like liberation but it's fairly limited. Um, and when I ask people about that now, they just point to like No Dabble or something. They're like, well, I went there, or like our articles also talk about that. And I'm like, no, I want to know how does your analysis. <coughs> actually make for a liberation for everybody and and usually met with silence. So I just I know that you're informed with my my thought. Yeah. So I think like Du Bois is really a fascinating character because he wrote like Black Reconstruction and he was a Marxist, you know, and out of Du Bois' work and a lot of black Marxists and the black radical tradition made the argument that a lot of, you know, white Marxists and, you know, American Marxists annoyed for the longest time that capital or that slavery was not a holdover from the feudal system, that it was a modern instrument to capitalism and w the wealth production and launching the United States as the, as the number one, you know, empire on the planet, you know, and it built that foundation that was denied for the longest time. Uh, and nobody reads those people anymore, right? Um, and I would say that indigenous people, we haven't, you know, we've, we've developed this framework of settler colonialism that takes into account those things. Um, and I would say you're not a Marxist if you don't believe in settler colonialism, and you're not a Marxist if you are not um, advocating for um, national liberation and decolonization in Turtle Island, because those are the tenets of Marxism and the most um, successful forms of class struggle that have been waged throughout the world in the 20th century, especially following um, World War II. And settler colonialism, indigenous studies, have all drawn from primarily those third world leftist traditions and when we talk about decolonization. So the occlusion of those frameworks um, is just pure chauvinism um, and settler nationalism, and it has no place in the movement. So. I don't really know what to say other than just like get with the program. <laughs> like, I've been doing this for 500 years. We're the longest uh, resistance movement in this hemisphere. So I think we have a lot to offer. Um, I think this like brings it back to like the first quote unquote settlement in the United States was um, by what is now the United States was by a Spanish. Uh, I can't remember his name. He's a conquistador, uh, but he set up this colony in what is now. South Carolina, and he took, he brought with him um, African and Caribbean indigenous slaves. And they, they settled for like a year, but then the Afro indigenous people began to communicate with the African um, slaves. And then they communicated with the Guales, who were the indigenous people in that area. And they all allied together and overthrew the Spanish and kicked them off the continent. And to me, that's where our history should begin because.
those in, those African slaves then um, were taken in as relatives, and they were the first permanent non-indigenous inhabitants of of what is now North America. And to me, that is where resistance began, and the first decolonization movement, and the first class struggle began on this. But you won't hear a lot of people talk about it that way. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't have a question, just a comment. I wanted to say, first of all, thank you so much for coming here and for your speech tonight, um, as well as for the book. Um, I haven't quite finished it yet. I'm about two-thirds of the way through, but it's, it's a great book. It's a very important book. I want to encourage anybody here who um, hasn't looked at it yet to pick up a copy and read it. I think it's very important. Uh, many different things about it um, that I've really been enjoying. But uh, one thing that's really impressed me, um, you know, you talked some in the introduction, and uh, the, the title itself is a reference to this uh, cyclical uh, nature of time as opposed to a linear um, version of time. And uh, I, I just think it's very rare to write what's essentially a history book, and so successfully um, throughout the book, keep going in, in circles and going cyclical instead of a linear telling of history. Um, and yeah, it's just. One, one aspect of the book that's really stood out. I really love the book, and thank you very much. I prefer the word dialectical, but <laughs> cyclical is good. <laughs> but no, thank you. Thanks for the comment. And then um, in the back. Oh, yeah. So I was going to say pretty much the same comment he said, because you did a really good job. You really, you really pieced it together. And I was like, I didn't know what I was gonna what I was coming into, but I was very pleasantly surprised and very well informed. So just wanted to thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Go. Yeah, um, um, I'm over seventy. Mm -hmm. So I remember in the sixties when decolonize America was a slogan when mm -hmm. it came out. Uh, and looking at the Venezuela thing at the moment and comparing it to something like what happened when, when a similar thing happened to the Allende government mm -hmm. in three years, the reaction of the press now uh, is totally different than it was in the 70s. When liberals were in senile, there were people who were, who, were, who were explaining the other side and were even sympathetic to it. Why do you think the production of ignorance has been so successful over the last 40 years in terms of uh, the way things now happen, yeah. that once we had thought, we had moved beyond. I think, I mean, it's, it is interesting. I mean, the difference between Allende and Maduro is, is Maduro is not dead um, for a reason. Um, because there is, it's, I think there's kind of, oh, that's a, that's a different story. I don't want to get into that, but I think the, the, <laughs> the other, um, what you're talking about is, uh, is important because it's something that I don't get into this book, but I, what I, I, I don't explicitly say it, but one thing that um, has really troubled me, not just as an academic, but as an organizer, um, is that there's a tendency to see the horizon of struggle as just the state, and, and this, this, the horizon of struggle is getting the state to recognize injury, and that's it. And so I think what the response to Venezuela, I mean, Allende happened during a time when there was a counterbalance to U.S. hegemony, right? It wasn't just the Soviet Union, it was this non-aligned movement and this third world movement. There's, you know, there was a different, there was a different world that was possible, at least the idea of it uh, existed in people's mind. And I would say that the cynicism around Venezuela is partially because people don't actually believe in that project anymore. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that as a blatant statement, but I think there's a hegemonic disbelief that there's something, the horizon of struggle goes beyond just the state. And I, I, I think that it's not we're trying to, I'm, I'm not trying to like reproduce the past. That's why I would say not cyclical. <laughs> we don't wanna like just like re try to recreate what was done in the past, but learn that there, there was you know, this moment, there could have been a different history, right? And that's why, I tie, you know, it's called Our History is the Future, and it's kind of a, I regret the title and only because people are like, well, what does the future look like? And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know, like, I don't know, like, I'm a historian, like, I move in the future looking backwards, right? Uh, and I navigate my trajectory forward by looking backwards with my, you know, my, my back turned to the future in some ways. So... Don't ask me any more questions about what the future looks like. But no, I appreciate that question. That wasn't, yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. That was, I hope that answered it. Yeah. I'm 
it's like they're trying to accommodate a safety environment and say, what can I produce actual racial equality? But considering as there are a lot of social movements that exist outside of the framework of decolonization, what would you say needs to be done to like decolonize social movements and decolonize society just like for the actions of tomorrow, not just the actions of like the the long term future? Yeah, I'm, I'm really, I try to avoid the language of decolonization and I use it kind of sparingly. I don't use it very much in this text um, because just if you go to the UN Charter on Decolonization and you read it, I teach a class and I have students read that and I'm like, it was, you know, it passed in like 1961, I think. And you, they read it and they're like, wow, statehood, sovereignty, like, colonizers actually go away and the complete reordering of society like and it doesn't really line up with what we now know as decolonization which if we like went to you know western africa and said i'm you know i want to decolonize they'd be like have a very specific idea of what that means right and so in many ways the, no the notion of decolonization i don't know if you can decolonize social movements social movements should be for decolonization you know and so like I'm really hesitant even around the notion of decolonizing knowledge because it's, it's, I think it's, it has a very specific history that means um, a specific thing um, to the majority of the world, you know, um, the, the poor and, you know, the darker nations as Du Bois called them. And to me, I, I'm hesitant to diminish that legacy by trying to make it into something else. But I do think, I, I know what you're saying in that sense. And um, I think, you know, it's like, as the as putting on the academic cap, it's like we do need more education. There can never be enough books about Standing Rock. This can't be the only one. I, dear God, I hope it's not. You know, um, that can't be um, the only book on one book on decol or, uh, settler colonialism. There's a good book by um, Manu Karaku called Empire's Tracks, which documents. He takes Lenin's thesis seriously about imperialism and reads Lenin alongside Frederick Jackson Turner to understand. Um, territorial imperialism and the expansion of the United States and settler colonialism is fundamentally about incorporating foreign territory, right? So why don't we understand imperialism and an anti-imperialist struggle is fundamentally tied to an anti-colonial struggle in the United States? I think there is new work that's being produced that changes um, the framework of how we think, how we how we talk about these things. And I, I would say that I've I've met more acceptance than I have resistance to these the things that I'm saying. And so um, I hope that um, not just me, I don't want to be the only person, right? The goal of like a uh, organizer is to reproduce oneself, you know, not, not biologically, even though that's important, but socially, right, to create um, new scholars and um, new intellectuals that, that'll take, take on this work. Is there another question over here? Okay, so, yeah. Well, thanks for the, for the book and for the talk. Um, I, I'm really intrigued by the, by, by the Buffalo Treaty that you mm -hmm. mentioned and just the, the way you, you often talk about non human as an important. I just wonder if you could just say a little more about that, especially how do we take seriously non human agency mm -hmm. in precisely the kind of struggle you talked about? And how, how, how do you get different indigenous epistemologists kind of think about mm -hmm. what, what non human agency looks like as we imagine what we call this? Yeah, I was um, speaking with my friend who's here. Um, he's writing a, uh, a vision of what the future may look like. And um, I was thinking about this as I was reading this, and I was thinking about like um, the, the fact that like we are, as indigenous peoples, very post-apocalyptic. Um, we've undergone several apocalypses. And one of them, I would say, is the, the severing of that relation to our non-human um, kin. Um, so we do have something to offer in that realm of like what if because we are we're not living we're already living in the apocalypse in many ways um, but I think that this that what I was trying to do with that that work is specifically think about um, how these treaties are often think of uh, they're just kind of anthropocentric and they, we think about it oh it's only in the relation to um, land right as left land is a static thing without other beings that live on it. Right, and I trace this through the kind of epistemology, our, our tradition um, through um, Te Skongwi, who was um, a woman, a primary prophet of our nation, who actually created our first treaty um, and brought us into correct relations um, with the non-human world because we were, you know, to be frank, we were kind of assholes for a little bit and we needed to be brought back into like 
um, uh, we had to make a, like a treaty with the Buffalo Nation and with um, the Deer Nation and all these other nations that we had treated poorly, that we would be good relatives to them, right? And so it's not just a, a kind of like metaphysical or mystical reading of the past, but it was also about survival. Like, how are we going to eat? You know, if we don't have buffalo, how are we, how are we gonna, you know, how are we gonna continue to live if we don't have clean drinking water? And so while there is this deep kind of esoteric connection with this non-human world, there's also, I think, um, a more important aspect of it is that, you know, we, we do have the right to um, be indigenous people. We have the right as humans to have access to clean drinking water. And that's a universal right, but I think what it doesn't separate us, but what makes those connections a little bit deeper is that there is um, an epistemological, cultural, and spiritual, and I don't want to get into that, don't ask me any questions about that, um, to these, these things that is very important. And I use Audra Simpson's ethnographic refusal to say, we will only allow you to see what we want you to see in those relations. And one of them actually made it onto the page of that treaty. And I've never heard like scholars talk about it. I've never heard people take that up. But when we talk about that treaty, that's how we interpret it, is that it was not just a treaty with a white supremacist empire, but it was a treaty to protect our non-human kin, the Buffalo Nation. Yeah. Um, I wasn't trying to um, undercut someone who was saying uh -huh. earlier about the uh, rewrite being like treaties. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking about what you're describing now. And when I think back to the 70s, you know, it was a kind of a beginning movement, genesis of environmental attitudes. Um, with a lot of protests and a lot of discussions, and then things got sophisticated. And I think back to the West where uh, people just said, all right, we're going to buy the water rights and we're going to take it off of the market. Or oh, we're going to uh, purchase this land and create land trusts. Yep. Um, I was just reading yesterday that uh, Toledo um, voted to give personhood to Lake Erie. Um, and so we always hear about corporations as now having Citizen United rights. Um, and I'm wondering what the opposite might be. And it seems like when you hear these newest treaties, NAFTA, trade treaties, uh, it's corporations mm -hmm. dictating to nation states how they don't have to acknowledge nation states. Yeah. And so how do you guys see as yourself a family that then becomes a nation from an individual? Um, it almost seems like uh, trying to be a nation uh, to compete with other nations, mm -hmm. when really it's a large accumulation of families. And I'm not really sure what my question is, but you see where I'm getting in there with? Yeah, I'm not an anthropologist. Um, and I think like what you're pointing to is that this, there's like this kind of teleology of what nation means, um, that all nations the idea that I, you know, that I was taught is that all nationalism or all nationhood like leads to Nazi Germany essentially is that it leads to this bad nationalism and that it should be opposed and it's awful and it's horrible but it assumes that uh, people who are never um, granted the right of nationhood to begin with are somehow going to like make those mistakes and I think like we can look at the Israeli settler colonial project to understand like yeah there are pitfalls in that right but also um, to say that um, like these, this, this idea of like personhood with um, granting personhood to, to non-humans is interesting, but it also assumes that the current state of the world and the, and the law treats people <laughs> like appropriately <laughs> to begin with. And the idea of humanity is also very questionable as well because not everyone was considered human at, at all points in times. We weren't considered human when they first came here People who were held as chattel weren't considered human. Um, they were considered property, right? Um, but also even granting them personhood hasn't equaled a whole lot of material progress in many ways as well. So I'm not like critical of it, I'm just, I'm critical of the system itself. What does it mean for a capitalist system that privatizes nature in the first place and commodifies it to grant personhood to it? Um, you mentioned earlier um, the massacres in Mankato, mm -hmm. and I know that there was like a small monument built for them. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you could like talk about like the 
how that was made and also like if there's anything else happening, if there is. Um, I, I, I've only been there once. Um, it's weird. I, uh, my great great grandmother was exiled. She's Dakota. She's exiled, and I never actually really went back to Minnesota very much. It just never. And so it's weird to go back. It's like, uh, uh, but I did go there, um, and it's still contentious in many ways. There's, um, you know, the the naming of Dakota um, places is, is contentious. Uh, Lake uh, Calhoun, formerly Lake Calhoun, was you know. Um, renamed, and um, a court found that it was done in, done so in a way that it can revert back to the the slaveholder's name Calhoun. Um, and there's an effort. I can't remember what it was. There's an effort to. Um, gosh, I can't remember what it was. There was a recent effort by the Senate. They passed a a, a measure to essentially um, prevent like the naming of of. A certain thing like a Dakota name, and I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's just funny because Minnesota is it's a Dakota name. <laughs> like they're gonna like I don't know what find themselves. I don't know, um, <laughs> but it's it's as much and you know it's interesting because Minnesota is kind of seen as you know it's like where our homegirl you know Ilan Omar like go Ilan, but she's from there and it's 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 a blue state. But it's also very rife with um, this violent settler colonial history, and New Mexico is is very similar, as well, um, very anti-indigenous in many ways. And so, I think that if there's a lesson from that, is to understand the limits of those kinds of um, politics. Um, but I don't really know, like, um, as far as the that site specifically. I know I went there with my friend, and it was really funny. He's just he's from Standing Rock. He's Dakota too, and he was just. We were walking around, and there was some like people dressed like, um, what's that show? The one with they wear the bonnets and they're dressed in red. Oh, um, the What? No. Hand hand hand. Hand. <laughs> Same thing. Uh, <laughs> well, that's what I think of too. I'm like, like standing or uh, was it The Walking Dead? Like when the world ends, like all the women start wearing dresses again. It's like we go back to the good old times when women knew their place. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> That's the limits of the imagination of settler society. But um, <laughs> going there, I mean, there's you know there's this execution site where the the U, the U.S.'s largest mass execution was held, and you have these handmaidens tell people like turning butter, you know, and doing like tour guides like this is the stables, this is where women made butter, uh, and it's kind of surreal because there is there is a plaque there, but there's no. Um, it's not like if you go to like the Holocaust Museum in Washington D.C. and you're like, holy, you know, holy shit, this was like a this was a real genocide. There's n there's nothing on par with that in the sense of the commemoration of what actually happened, right? Because if you commemorate that, it it it's to say that the foundation of Minnesota statehood is premised on the genocide of a, of Dakota people and the exile from that land. Does that make the state of Minnesota an illegitimate state? You know, I mean, that's that's a question. It's it's a, it's an existential question for um, settler states. I think in many ways, South Dakota was founded, or was um, gained statehood the year before the Wounded Knee Massacre, and the Wounded Knee Massacre essentially consecrated statehood, and opened up through the Great Sioux Agreement, opened up nine million acres of land, right? Um, so I grew up there, and I, I was there, and it was never connected to the reservation a few, well, a few, um, uh, a few minutes away, and so, um, and also, yes, and also they have like festivals for <laughs> Little House on the Prairie right next to there, um, which I thought was very interesting. So essentially, not really, not really big, which, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned like having to kind of stand apart from like the tribe on certain mm -hmm. issues, and I'm like curious about if you have like more general reflections on like the relationship between like the radical indigenous left and like tribal governments. That are yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't consider the people who stood against the tribe necessarily as identifying as leftist by any means. Maybe progressive, I don't know. But they, they, it was a, there's their understanding of it was much different. But also, it was um, it was an electoral battle as well. So they were trying to get certain people elected on council. 
that reflected this grassroots movement. And so like any nation, like any you know, municipality, state, you know, national government, we are diverse and we have different ideas about um, nationhood and what our nation should and shouldn't do and sovereignty. Um, we talk about it in this kind of, in its, in its capacity to protect and advance certain struggles, but in, it's also a sovereign right of our nation to negotiate with a multinational energy corporation, right? Um, and there's also sovereignty in economic development, right? Um, we are as much, you know, we're trapped in this system as much as any other kind of like group of people. Um, and I think what the grassroots movement that was kind of opposing the decision of our own tribal nation in um, making relations with Trans Canada um, was about was really trying to, to envision a different path to um, nationhood. But also we had signed this treaty, um, Honor the Earth um, Treaty, back in 2011, and, or is it 2012? I can't remember, it's 2011 or 2012, but we signed this treaty. We don't just make treaties with our colonizers, we also make treaties with each other. And we signed this treaty with um, First Nations in Alberta who were affected by the tar sands. And it was actually adopted by the Great Plains Tribal Chairmen's Association, which represents 14 um, tribal nations on, on, on the Northern Plains. And it was adopted that we would not um, allow the, trans or the, the extraction, transportation, or refinement of oil sands through our treaty territory. And so in many ways, while we were trying to uphold the 68 treaty, we are also trying to get our own tribal nation to recognize, because it signed that treaty. Uh, as well, and so trying to get them to uphold the, the agreement that they made with their First Nations people, to be good relatives, essentially. And they did, I mean, they reversed the decision. Uh, Standing Rock was kind of a catalyst, and they came out opposed to Standing Rock, and um, it's, it's a much more, it's a different conversation, a much more open conversation now about um, energy and oil development. I was at a, a meeting with tribal um, council members, and we were talking about heteropatriarchy. <laughs> I was like, never imagined in my wildest dreams, but it was because of Standing Rock that they were having this conversation about like, you know, leadership and who has the right to lead and how a lot of our men have been, you know, when the patriarchs came, they left patriarchs when they left. And so this was a conversation we're having with tribal councilmen, which is really cool to have. And I don't think that would have been possible without a movement like Standing Rock. So I think um, I'm going to end it there. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much.